y'all. Good morning, Reach Church. How y'all doing this morning? That was great, that game. I want to say happy Mother's Day to all the mothers, and specifically to you, sir. Happy Mother's Day, because you are the best mother here <laughs> yet. That was awesome. <laughs> I'm so uh, excited to be with you guys this morning, and I know that um, this is Mother's Day, so it's a special holiday for a lot of people in this room. I want to say thank you to Pastors Chad and Sarah for allowing me to share this spot with you guys. Um, it's an honor and privilege, and I, I don't take it lightly that you would allow me to speak um, this Sunday. So I'm excited to be here. We have a message. I have a message for all of the women in the room. Can I hear the ladies? Yes, yes. We got a message for you, whether you are a mother or not. I want to encourage you today of some things that I feel like God's been speaking to me in my personal life. Um, but before we do that, I just want to say thank you to my husband who's here with me today, Aaron. He told me he wouldn't stand up. Aaron, stand up. Aaron, stand up. Come on, come on, encourage him, encourage him. Yeah. <laughs> he said, do not say stand up in service because I'm not getting up. But you guys helped me. Thank you so much. Um, let's pray before we go into the word. And I want to pray this morning because here's the thing about Mother's Day. Um, with this holiday, your emotions can lean towards one way or the other. Either glee and excitement and celebration, or it can lean towards the other way of sadness and shame and whatever the case may be. Because Mother's Day is a joyful day for some people, and some days it's just not. And so I want to pray this morning. I want to pray for everyone in the room, especially those that maybe today is more of a difficult day, um, because I believe that God can bring healing and that even on days like this where normally your emotions maybe are everywhere or you're feeling some kind of way about history or future, whatever the case may be, that, that God is here with you today and that we'll feel his presence. So let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for your presence. Thank you, God, that you are so available to us that all we have to do is go to you in prayer and you hear every single word that we pray. God, today is a day of celebration and joy. It's a holiday where we celebrate the women in our lives, the mothers in our lives. But God, we know that today can also be a difficult day for people. And so today we want to lift up every person that, that maybe today is a little bit more of a sad day. Lord, those that, that, the women that are, are struggling to, to get pregnant and to have children, those that maybe have lost their mothers or have a broken relationship with their mothers, Lord, we lift up every single one of your children today on this Mother's Day, God. And we look towards you for healing, for redemption, for peace, for joy. God, you said you would give us joy unspeakable, that when it didn't even, doesn't even make sense for us to have joy, you'll give us joy. And that's what we're, our prayer is today, Lord God, that as we celebrate this holiday, Lord Jesus, that you will mend broken hearts, that you will hear our cries and our prayers, that God, you will answer those prayers and that you will heal us. Lord, I thank you for this message that, that you have given me today, and I thank you that it will speak to every woman in this place and that we will leave an expectation and excitement for the future and the things to come. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Well, I am going to jump right in. Today's title of the message is The Gift That Keeps On Giving. The Gift That Keeps On Giving, okay? And, and it's a very simple message. I feel like this is something that God has been speaking to me in my life, and so I wanted to share it. I, I really have a hard time teaching or speaking on anything that God is not dealing with in my own personal life. So you guys are kind of into my quiet time, my journal time right now with what I'm going to share with you. But this is something that I believe God has been sharing with me, and he wanted me to present this to you today. So, so what I, the, 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 the bottom line today that I want to get to is that every woman in here, and really this is for men too, but I'm speaking to the women today, so guys just bear with me, all right? Every woman in here is a gift. You are a gift. And here's the thing. Oftentimes life has told us differently. Life has told us that we're more of a burden than a blessing. Life has told us that we're more of a problem than something to praise. God is telling us today that you are a gift. So I want every woman in here to say, I am a gift. Okay, now say it a little bit louder like you actually mean it and maybe believe it a little bit, okay? I am a gift. Now look at the man in your life, maybe the children that are ungrateful in your life, and say, I am a gift. I am a gift. Okay, so today we're going to talk about how and why you are a gift from God. 
Now, anytime there is a gift involved, there's three different elements that, that are involved in a gift giving situation, okay? You have the giver, the person that's gonna give the gift, the actual gift, and the recipient. Okay, today I want to help encourage the women that God is the giver of the gift, we are the gift, and that every person around us is the recipient of God's gift that is us. Okay, and so today we're going to talk about that a little bit. We're going to look through four different lives of four different women in the Bible and talk about why do we know that we are a gift from God. But before we do that, let's go to Psalms 139. And I love this scripture. This is Psalms 139, 13 through 18. I'm reading from the NLT version. It says, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God? They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. This is a beautiful poem that David wrote to God. And basically what David is saying, I am, you are such a good gift giver. He's talking to God here. You're such a good gift giver that when I look at myself, it makes me worship you. When I look at the marvelous creation that you made in me, it makes me turn towards you and worship. Now, how often in our lives can we say that we look at ourselves and it makes us worship God? Okay, maybe after a little concealer or, you know, a new hair dye or something, maybe it makes us worship. But how often in our lives as women can we look at ourselves and say, man, I am a gift to this earth. I am a gift to the people around me. God made me a gift and it makes me worship him because of how he made me. This is what we're going to talk about today. So, so here's the thing. Point number one, and I've already said it, you are a gift. Point blank period. You are a gift. No matter what you've been told, no matter what your mother and father said to you, no matter what the people who rejected you in life have said, no matter what you've even told yourself, God has made you as a gift to this earth. You are a gift and it is on us to realize that because if we don't, then we sway our, our definition of ourselves based on what everyone else thinks about us. And so I believe that this, this, this scripture is important for us to not only read, but to believe that God made us a marvelous creation. Now, how many of you guys have gotten a really good gift before? Have you gotten a really good, okay, a couple people, okay, some husbands need to step up a little bit. Okay, I see that. I see a couple of ladies didn't raise their hand. Okay. I have gotten some really good gifts in life, okay? Two of them in particular that I remember that they just knocked my socks off, okay? So there's two of them, one when I was a kid, one when I was uh, an adult, just a couple of years ago, actually. Uh, the first one was, when I was a kid, I used to play uh, a game called school. Now, I don't know if anybody else plays school, but basically all of my kid games are actually adult games. I play school, church, and house, okay? So in school, I was always the teacher. In my mind, I was going to grow up and be a teacher. Now, I didn't know I was going to be this kind of teacher, but in my mind, I was going to grow up and I was going to be a teacher. My mom knew that, and one year for Christmas, her and my dad got me the best gift in the world, a chalkboard. Oh, my gosh. Y'all, when I opened up that chalkboard, I was filled with glee. I was so excited. I was running around the house. I was so happy because my mom had invested in my career advancement. <laughs> I obviously didn't have much of an imagination when I was a kid. And so I love that gift. The second gift that I remember knocked my socks off was a couple years ago, my husband got me a designer purse. Now, let me say this. I'm not really a designer type of girl, okay? Uh, favorite places to shop, the sales rack at Target, uh, the sales rack at Walmart. Um, the sales rack pretty much anywhere, okay? This is, this, I'm a sales shopper, so I like to look for the discount. I'm always trying to get something, you know, a full outfit for $25 is like a score for me. So I'm not really a designer type of girl. But one year, my husband got me a designer purse, y'all, and I promise you, it was like he gave me the gift of salvation. 
I was so elated. I didn't even know I wanted it as a gift. And when I got it, I opened it up and the purse matched the bag that it was in. The pur First of all, the purse was in a bag and not a Walmart sack. An actual like cloth bag, okay? Like that, I had like a drawstring, like what? I didn't even know purses came like that. So the purse is in the bag, then the bag is in a box, the box is, it has a bow, and all of them are the same color. I'm like, what the heck is going on here? This is the best gift in my life. So literally, I was crying profusely, like so excited that I was given this gift, didn't even know that I wanted it, but wore it every day after that. Because that gift was so important to me. It was important because number one, I knew that my husband had to sacrifice for that gift. Now I'm not for sure where he was saving this money up because I didn't see it come out of the account. I'm, the, I'm that wife that looks at the account every day. <laughs> That's me. I don't know where he was saving this money up, but I knew he had to save it somewhere. I mean, he wasn't like selling drugs on the side or nothing like that, so. <laughs> he had to have something in this drawer or something. I don't know. We'll talk about it later. Anyways. <laughs> but I knew he had to sacrifice for that gift and that it took a lot of work and a lot of effort to get that gift for me. So I was elated not just for the gift, but for the sacrifice that was put into getting me that gift. It's the same thing that Jesus did on the cross for us. He made a really huge sacrifice for the gifts in all of us. And that, that, that it's on us to realize that he made us that gift so that when we're around other people, we behave as if we are a gift. If we think we're a burden, we're going to behave as if we are a burden. If we think we're a problem, we're going to behave as if we are a problem. But if, God, if you see yourself as God's gift to this earth, it changes everything. So look at, let's look at four things. To fully enjoy a gift, I believe there's four things that every gift has to go through, okay? So these are four things that, that a physical, like my purse, gift would have to go through, but then also for you. The four things, and I'm going to say them, and then I'll go into each one of them. The gift, to fully enjoy a gift, a gift has to be chosen, it has to be delivered, it has to be open, and it has to be utilized. So let's look at chosen. There's a the story in the Bible of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and this is in Luke 1, 26 through 38. We've got a lot of scripture for you today, okay? In Luke 1, 26, it says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. I love this next, this next sentence. It says, confused and disturbed. <laughs> Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be the son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. But Mary asked the angel, how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come to you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby will be born holy and he will be called the Son of God. And I'm going to skip down to 38. It says, Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. I love this story because it was obvious that Mary was chosen. That as a gift, God chose her to carry the Son of God. But if you look at when the angel first came to Mary and said, Greetings, favored women. The Lord is with you. There was two different emotions that Mary had. She was confused and disturbed. Now, I wonder, why was Mary confused and disturbed? I mean, granted, an angel came into her room. That makes a lot of sense, right? That's a little confusing. But could it have been that what the angel said to Mary... Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. That maybe that spoke against a lot of what Mary had heard in her life. That when the angel said favored woman, it didn't really connect with what Mary had heard all of her life. Why would Mary be confused and disturbed by what the angel said? I mean, he literally just came and complimented her. That was it. And yet and still she was like, hmm? Me? Are you sure? 
Could it have been that Mary did not know what it felt like to be chosen? That maybe she had went through some rejection in her life. Maybe she had went through some failures in her life. Maybe she had went through some shame in her life. So much so that when the angel came and literally just gave her a compliment, she didn't even know how to receive it. How many of us, just let's think about just compliments in general. How many of us as women, when someone says something to us that's just nice, it confuses and disturbs us? Me? This outfit? This, what, me? Because... We have lived so much of our lives knowing what it feels like to not be chosen that oftentimes when God is saying to us, I have chosen you, is something doesn't connect. But what God was saying to Mary is, you are the plan. You are the plan that I want to set forth in this earth. Don't be shaken by it. Don't be disturbed. Don't be confused. What I'm telling you is even though other people may not have chosen you, maybe you didn't get on the Palm Squad, I'm telling you today, I have chosen you. You are the plan. So you may be wondering, why did God give me these kids? Why did God put me in this marriage? Why am I at this business or this place of work? Because God has chosen you. Before you can give anyone a gift, you got to choose what you're going to give them. And what God said is, I chose you, every single person on this earth. First of all, God is the only giver of life. So every person on this earth is intentionally, deliberately chosen to be on this earth. And so what God is saying is, I have chosen you. Don't spin your wheels trying to figure out why. Just go ahead and receive it. Now, this doesn't mean that life is going to be easy and that everything's going to be peaches and cream all the time. But he still chose you. He knew that you had the capacity for that marriage. He knew that you had the capacity for that child with special needs. He knew that you had the capacity. And so that's why God placed you in the family he placed you in. That's why he placed you in the marriage that you're in, the friendships that you're in, the job that you're in, because he chose you just as much as God had a plan for Jesus. When he came on this earth, he has a plan for you. Now, our plans are different, but he has a plan for you just as much as he knew what he wanted Jesus to come to this earth and do is the same amount of intentionality that he put into allowing you to enter this earth. There is no child that got by God. There is no child that's like, oh, how did they get here? I didn't mean for that to happen. God is not shocked by it. He's intentional only. And so he chose you and I to be on this earth. Mary questioned how this could happen. When they said that you're going to carry Jesus, he said, how is this going to happen? And oftentimes we ask the same thing. When we run up against something that seems like it's impossible or something that's really, really difficult, we ask ourselves, we ask God, how? God was saying, I'll make that happen. I just need you to accept the fact that I have chosen you. I need you to accept the fact that I love you so much that I placed you on this earth because I knew that everybody that came in contact with your life would see me through you. If you accept that I have chosen you. So, okay, so we've chosen the gift, right? What happens after that? Okay, so if after my husband decided that he was going to buy that present, now you actually have to give that present to the recipient. You have to deliver the present. So the second thing after the gift is chosen is that the gift is delivered to the intended recipient or to the intended destination. I believe that oftentimes... We may know that we're chosen by God, but we're not really sure how to get to that intended destination of freedom and healing, redemption. And I believe today that God wants to speak a word of deliverance today. That that just as much as you take a gift from one place from where it is to where it needs to be, that God wants to do the same thing in our lives He wants to take us from where we are to where we need to be. And we see this in Mark 5 with the woman with the issue of blood. She's our second lady that we're going to look at today. In Mark 5, 25 through 34, it says, In the crowd was a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. My God. 
uh, she had gone to so many doctors and they had not done anything except cause her a lot of pain. She had paid them all the money she had, but instead of getting better, she only got worse. The woman had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him in the crowd and barely touched his clothes. And she said to herself, if I could just touch his clothes, I will get well. As soon as she touched them, her bleeding stopped and she knew she was well. At that moment, Jesus felt power go out of him. He turned to the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, look at all these people crowding around you. How can you ask who touched you? But Jesus turned to see who had touched him. The woman knew what had happened to her. She came shaking with fear and knelt down in front of Jesus. Then she told him the whole story. And Jesus said to the woman, you are now well because of your faith. May God give you peace. You are healed and you will no longer be in pain. Here's the thing about this lady. She had had this issue for 12 years of her life. 12 years is a long time. It's like going to college three times. 12 years is like going to high school three times. 12 years is a really long time. Long enough to get used to it. Long enough to say, you know what? This is my lot in life. There, there's no, I would have went to every doctor. I tried to get well. They're not doing anything. They've taken all my money. They, I've literally only gotten worse from going to the doctors. I might as well just get used to it. But there was something in this lady. It was something in this lady where she knew that healing was possible. That she knew that I'm, there's no way I'm living my abundant life right now. There's no way that this is the life that I'm supposed to live. And I believe sometimes as gifts, as women, that there's a time where we have to get to, a point where we have to get to where we say, you know what, I know this has been happening for a long time, but this is not my lot in life. I know there's healing and redemption. I know there's wholeness. I know that I can get somewhere else in life that God can deliver me from where I am to where I need to be. This woman was so clear that there was no way that she could live out the calling and what God has placed in her heart to do with this illness. She knew it. She was fatigued. She was tired. She was she was scorned. People didn't even want her around because of her illness. And she knew that that was not her abundant life that God had promised her. And so she went for her healing. What are the things in our lives? That it's just been here for so long. The pain has been here for so long. The unforgiveness has been here for so long. The busyness and the fatigue and the running around from here to there has been here so long. The hurt has been here so long that we've gotten used to it. That instead of believing for healing, we've now just settled in it. We've now just decided maybe this is life. Maybe I'm always supposed to be frustrated. Maybe I'm always supposed to be tired. Maybe I'm always supposed to be stressed out. Because it's been happening for so long, it feels like this is me. I'm here to tell you today that as the gift to the people around you, to this earth, God is saying, you don't have to live that way. You don't have to live in that pain and in that hurt and in that fear. You don't have to live that way. There is healing and there is deliverance that God can provide to you and to me. But it's about getting that tenacity that that woman had. That woman came into a space where she was not welcome. She brought her fatigued body that was probably so tired from years and years of this disease. She brought her shame. She brought her guilt. She probably had some unforgiveness towards some people that had treated her wrong. She brought all of that and said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, if I can just get a little touch of his clothes, I know I can be made whole. And her faith made her whole immediately. But it's on us to realize, you know what? (laughs) This is not abundant living. I'm breathing and calling it living. But this isn't living, not in the way that God intended me to live. This frustration, this fear, this pain, 
It's been there since I was a little girl. Now it's grown up with me, so it's kind of like a BFF. It's kind of like a friend that I'm just used to being around. And God is saying today, do you want to live like that? What if you could just glance on the other side and see what freedom looks like? See what healing looks like. See what forgiveness looks like. Because it is in your reach. Just like it was in this woman's reach, it is in your reach. She fought through her own weaknesses to get to God's healing. Same thing we have to do. We have to fight through our own weaknesses to get to the healing of God. That's the package, the gift being delivered from the place where it was to the place where it needs to be. So, so, okay, so after the gift is chosen and delivered, obviously when I went through my bag and then my box and then my bag and then finally got to my purse, a gift has to be opened. A gift has to be unwrapped and open so that it can be utilized eventually. In 1 Samuel 1, 10 through 17, it's the story of Hannah. And Hannah, I love this story because Hannah is, is so real in this story. She was totally brokenhearted because she could not have a child. She had a nasty sister wife named Panina, and she was just foul. Panina was just talking about her, making her feel bad at the kitchen table, I mean at the dinner table. And Hannah was so upset with her that she went to go pray and talk to God. And in 1 Samuel, that's where we'll pick up. 1 Samuel 10, 1 and 10, it says, Hannah was brokenhearted and was crying as she prayed. Lord, all powerful, I am your servant, but I am so miserable. Please let me have a son. I will give him to you for as long as he lives and his hair will never be cut. Hannah prayed silently to the Lord for a long time, but her lips were moving and Eli thought she was drunk. Eli, you know, just coming in, just jumping to conclusions, Eli. Eli came in, he says, how long are you going to stay drunk? He asked, sober up. Hannah said, sir, please don't think I'm no good. I'm not drunk and I haven't been drinking. But I do feel miserable and terribly upset. I've been praying all this time, telling the Lord about my problems. And Eli replied, you may go home now and stop worrying. I'm sure the God of Israel will answer your prayer. Here's the thing about being opened as a gift. It takes a level of vulnerability. It takes a level of transparency to allow people to see the real you, the pain, the weaknesses, the gaps, the disconnect, all the things that you have inside of you. It takes a level of vulnerability. And this is what Hannah did. Hannah was, was vulnerable in two different ways. She was, number one, transparent with God. She didn't come to God with some eloquent speech about needing or wanting to have a son. She said, God, I am miserable. She was honest with him. And then when Eli came in and even accused her of being drunk, instead of throwing up her walls and getting frustrated with Eli, she was honest with Eli. She said, no, 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 I'm not drunk, you crazy man. I am sad. <laughs> I'm miserable. God is asking us as gifts. We do not know what it's like to feel to be open and unwrapped until we can be transparent with number one with God, but then second with community. We have to be open with God and tell him exactly what's on our heart. Whatever fears, whatever worries, whatever doubts, it doesn't make us less of a Christian or less of a believer. We have to be honest with God, but then also God put people in our lives. Community that we have to be open and honest with as well. I, I, I made up this little thing. I don't know if it's right, y'all, but I made this thing up and, and I say it to myself. I say that God always asks me to be honest and then tell the truth. So when I pray, if I'm struggling with something or I'm dealing with something really heavy, I'm honest with God. I tell him exactly how I feel about whatever's going on. But then after that, I speak the truth over myself. So I get the word and I speak scripture over myself. So it makes me not, it, 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 it makes me not fake with God. I tell him exactly how I feel, but then I tell myself what he says to me. So you got to be honest and then you got to tell the truth because the truth may not line up with your honesty. 
The truth may be very different than how you're feeling. God is not asking you to, to, to degrade or act like you don't have different feelings. He wants you to express those feelings to him, but then also back it up with some truth. And so God is saying, as a gift, one reason maybe that you may be struggling with seeing yourself as a gift is that you have not allowed yourself to be open, to be unwrapped, to be seen, and to be heard. Because maybe somebody taught you that, that vulnerability is weakness, that crying is weakness, that, that, that you can't share how you feel with other people because what if they think something different about you? What if they think that you're less of a Christian because of what you're going through? God is saying to live, to fully enjoy the life of being a gift, you have to allow yourself to be open. So after we're open, the very last thing is to be utilized. A gift is not a gift if it's not being utilized, right? I mean, it's just sitting on the counter, collecting dust. Matter of fact, I need to go pick that purse up because I really haven't worn it in a couple months. Um, but a gift is a gift when you can actually utilize it. And this has to do with calling. Maybe there's a part of you that doesn't feel like a gift because you're not actually operating in the calling that God has called you to. Maybe you're sitting on the back seat instead of taking the seat that he asked you to. Maybe you've put all of everyone else's needs before your own, and so you're not doing what God said do. Maybe God has given you a business idea or a ministry idea. Maybe he's asked you to speak a word of encouragement, but fear has stopped you from going and doing what he's asked you to do. It, there's a level of frustration that we will feel as gifts if we're not being utilized the way that God intended us to be utilized. And we see this in the book of Esther. Now, Esther is a beautiful story of a young lady that was brought to the king and became his wife. And she, she basically rescued all of the Jews from, from uh, imminent danger. I mean, they were going to be killed, basically. And she stepped in as a Jew, and she saved her people. God used her beauty. He used her talents. He used her giftings to save people's lives. And she was talking one day to her uncle Mordecai, cousin Mordecai, and in Esther 4 and 14, and he says, this is Mordecai talking to Esther. He says, if you, keep, if you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. In other words, Esther, if you don't stand up for us, God is going to save us but you're going, to see, you're going to see death because you didn't do what you were supposed to do. So then he says, and this is a question that I'm giving to every single gift in this room. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this? Yeah. Esther had no idea that she was going to end up in this role in her life. She had no idea that this was what God called her to. But she found herself here. And what, her, what Mordecai was saying to her is, who knows? Maybe you were made queen because you were the one that was supposed to save us. You were the one that was supposed to go before the king and change all of everyone else's life. Who knows? Maybe you were, you were put in that spot as a wife because you were supposed to change a generational curse. Maybe you are the mother of those children because there's something you're supposed to give to them. Maybe you're in that office because you're supposed to help those coworkers. God is saying, if you're not being utilized as a gift and in the calling that I've called you to, you are going to feel frustrated. Because you know you're here for something bigger, but you're not stepping out in it. You know you, that God has whispered dreams and visions and callings, and he's shown you giftings. People are complimenting you on stuff that's just natural to you. It's a gift. These are things that God is saying, if you don't operate in, you are going to feel very, very stuck and you won't see your life as a gift. And who knows that if maybe if you actually walk out in your calling, you actually step out in the dreams and the visions that God has placed in your heart, you start that business, you have those babies, you stay at home as a mom instead of going to work, or you going to work instead of staying home. Who knows that if God whispered those things to you, that other people's lives aren't attached to that. 
Somebody is waiting on you. The Jews were waiting on, on Esther. They were waiting on Esther to do what God, and she felt the fear. She almost was quiet. She almost didn't do what she was supposed to do because of her own insecurities, because of her own fears, because maybe she'd been rejected before and she knew what it felt like. But they were waiting on her. They were waiting on her to see herself as the gift, to see herself as the plan, to see herself as the way out. Somebody is attached to you, women. Somebody's life, somebody's freedom, somebody else's gifting and calling, somebody's future is waiting on you to realize, I'm here for a reason. And I'm going to walk out and do what God's called me to do. Yeah, I got a lot of insecurities. Yeah, I got a lot of fear. But I'm going to do what God's called me to do. It's so funny because I was, as I was preparing for this message, I felt that fear. And I felt that insecurity. And I was like, Lord, I don't know if I'm the one. I mean, they invited me. But, I mean, it was off of one time. Can I do it again? I mean... You know, I'm about to come in here and probably be one of maybe five black people, Lord. Are they going to receive me? Are they going to like me? Are they going to listen to what you're saying? And I heard it as clear as day. You are the plan. You are the plan. And I'm saying it to you. God asked me to step out of my fears and insecurities to come share this message with somebody else to be unlocked. Somebody else to see, I am a gift. No, people may not treat me like it. Maybe my husband ain't romantic as I want him to be, and my kids don't obey like I want him to, but I am a gift. And I'm going to live as so. So whoever you are and whatever you're dealing with today, hear me. And I mean... Repeat this to yourself until your heart leans into it, until you actually believe these words. You are a gift. Let's pray.